University of Vienna. Yeah, looking at his impressive CV, he went through several positions, starting with Interligan, uh, BSF, the University of Cambridge, ETH Zurich, University of Hamburg. Um, yeah, he, and he has been also a visiting professor and a lecturer at the National Institute of Warrenville and the University of Calgary. And there's another section about his research interest, but better he tell me about this than me. So Johannes, please. Thanks very much for the kind introduction. A big thank you also to Alexandre for giving me the opportunity to give this uh, lecture today. That's a great pleasure and honor. Um, so just uh, very briefly to give you one picture of the group that was the pre-pandemic group because uh, we need to, we are still working on the group picture, but that list uh, here is up to date. And um, a special thanks today go to uh, Ya Chen or um, also, um, Anya, um, Anya is here and in the audience um, over there, because she contributed, I think, 90% of the, the, the original search from our group that I will present to you today, and also Konrad Stoch. And at this um, um, time, I would also take the opportunity to thank, say a big thank you to Matthias Rare, because um, most of this work um, came still when I was affiliated with the University of. Hamburg, and it was just the perfect place for me to have a jump start as an independent researcher. So that was really enjoyable uh, years there. So our research group is um, is developing and applying uh, methods, computational methods for early drug discovery. So we have loads of uh, academic research, uh, drug discovery research projects that we are contributing to, but we also uh, do um, a lot of method development, uh, mainly actually in metabolism and toxicity prediction, and lots of our research is in the context of natural products. And uh, today I would like to give you a bit of a general, more general overview of what, what the relevance is of chemoinformatics in natural product uh, drug, uh, based drug discovery. So as Gisbert already mentioned, um, a substantial part of uh, the current small molecule drugs come actually from nature. Um, if you look at this a bit uh, more in detail, then we see the, the, the actual natural product that directly make it to a drug is very low. It's only 5%. But uh, lots of compounds or lots of approved drugs are inspired by natural products, by the pharmacophores, uh, the underlying pharmacophores, patterns, and so on. And if you look a bit more detailed in the statistics, this is something that is not so present if you if you read the literature. There's one fact that I would like to mention. It is uh, that uh, many of the natural product derived uh, drugs have actually a high molecular weight and they are focused to some extent on steroids and, and macrolides. So it's not an even distribution. So where does the bioactivity of natural products come from? Why are they so interesting for us? Uh, one reason is that plants simply can't run away, right? So we need basically compounds that protect, uh, with which the plants can protect them from fungal infections, from uh, caterpillars. So I'm not, I'm not referring to the machines, but uh, to the bugs, uh, sheep, cattle, and so on. So we need compounds that actually have a biological response, and that response can be quite uh, drastic. It can reach from anything to bitter to Ultra toxic. So only because it's natural, it does not necessarily mean it's harmless. Although uh, this is what often is you know, uh, the picture that is perceived from advertisements or generated by advertisements. So natural products uh, have undergone um, optimization throughout the course of evolution. So it's a wide range of uh, biological activities in different organisms, and also um, basically. We have many privileged structures that originate from uh, natural products, which means that these scaffolds are able to bind in a specific manner to multiple different proteins. We also observe higher hit rates in biological assays, although this can also be related to um, um, non-specific interactions or assay interference. Uh, so very important if something is uh, uh, if a compound is active in a plant or so it has also a good chance to be active in human maybe on a different on a, on a related protein so for example I was uh, working for some time in BSF and there the, the quest was how can you design small molecules 
that target specifically, um, you know, and target organism a, a, a pest. Um, that's actually very tricky because the protein may be structurally fairly preserved. The trick is uh, to often, often to exploit metabolism, changes in metabolism and absorption in transporters. There is where the organisms tend to differ much largely, uh, much larger than, than just on the target protein itself. So um, now already coming to the context of chemoinformatics, um, natural products have some, some uh, particular characteristics. They are enormously diverse in their physical chemical and structural uh, properties. So we see here uh, um, physical chemical properties in a PCA uh, plot, and we see that the natural products uh, are just uh, cover much broader uh, chemical space. And we see here one example, uh, Paclitaxel, which is a very important anti-cancer drug, and um, it's highly complex. You see uh, multiple CSP3 um, uh, carbon atoms that are, uh, we have chirality, we have complex ring systems, um, we have a complex uh, three-dimensional uh, shape, and what also comes uh, in addition is that we often need to deal actually with uh, sugar mo moieties. And one of the real, of the, of the hard limitations of natural product research is actually the avail availability of, of compounds, right? So basically, when uh, people started to develop Baclid Excel and use it, they basically, for, for a single cancer patient, you would need to kill uh, eight uh, yew uh, trees uh, that are age of age 60 years, right? They are 60 years old trees. So uh, if you go simply by um, isolating these compounds, then we would soon run out of yew trees. So, so one point is this limited availability um, of the materials. And other points uh, can be simply also just uh, bureaucratic. Think about how difficult it can be to get such materials, plant materials, um, and other, of other organisms across borders. And then to isolate it, um, isolate it, test it, uh, synthesize it, and so on. Another problem is that uh, natural products tend to give higher false positive hit rates in biological assays. Just to show you the scale of the problem, is um, I just want to show you the super drug here, which is uh, quercetin, which uh, you may be well familiar with, and well familiar with um, for, for a good reason, because it appears in uh, every third paper <laughs> that is on bioactive compounds. So I, I just checked uh, as of today uh, in the PubChem database, there are conclusive test results uh, for quercetin on 427 different proteins listed, among which quercetin has been reported as active on 268. And of course, among them are also many of the proteins that are related to SARS-CoV-2 research. So uh, if they would really be what they pretend to be, then I'm not sure why we are still troubling with the pandemic and other diseases. So we need to be very careful with these uh, readouts from biologic, biological assays. And in, in, with regard to computational methods, we have what we have already seen, this huge diversity, molecular uh, complexity, flexibility, in particular, so conformational flexibility. Um, 3D approaches often depend on a correct stereochemistry, which is not always uh, available for natural products. In particular, it's not always complete. So we have incomplete data. And uh, many of the computational methods have been uh, simply designed biased towards synthetic compounds. So we need to be extra careful when using them with natural products. So um, chemoinformatics methods uh, play a key role in natural products based drug discovery because they allow us to exploit with much higher efficacy or efficiency um, the natural products uh, chemical space, in particular with regard to the retrieval organization and curation management of uh, chemical information on natural products. Uh, for example, lots of databases out there, including those from uh, uh, Jose Medina Franco and um, also from Chris Steinberg's group did a lot in this direction. A visualization and analysis, a lot comes from Alexandra's uh, group on that. Then uh, important role in natural product dereplication because the problem is that many, many times you are looking at the same thing and you need to realize early that you're looking at something that is not novel, an important part, molecular property prediction, then the identification of bioactive compounds or even 
just species, particular plants that are uh, particularly of interest for your uh, target of interest. Then uh, to upscale uh, basically bioactivity prediction, uh, we have methods to allow the prediction of the bioactivity spectra, in other words, uh, target prediction. Uh, Giesbert actually uh, and his group uh, have done a lot on that. And atomy and toxicity prediction, uh, the design of nature uh, inspired compounds, again with uh, Giesbert and his uh, de, um, de novo design and the de, um, computational design approaches as in a leading role. Um, natural product likeness assessment, where there were some um, very important publications, for example, from Peter Ertl. And uh, last but not least, um, oh, so sorry. Um, I've, so, first, I would like to start um, with um, virtual screening. So, virtual screening, you've heard around a lot um, about that already from, for example, uh, Thierry's lecture or so Matthias Rai's lecture. So we have uh, everything from very simple approaches to um, more complex approaches um, available. So we need to, um, you know, we have these challenges, uh, like so we need to deal with the structural complexity, then with the limited quality, the coverage and the size of, uh, of bioactivity data sets. I will show you a bit on that on the next slide. Just uh, for information, so right now, at, at this time, there are about 2,000 natural products that are co-crystallized uh, with a protein and structures available in the protein data bank. So this is about the size of the data that we are talking about. If you're looking at a small molecule data sets, so natural products, then um, the, the outstanding one is actually coconut with 400,000 compounds. You need to be careful because with this number, a bit careful because there's a lots of um, uh, sorts of duplicates in there. And the problem is that uh, in coconut, there are also many synthetic compounds and many semi-synthetic compounds. So one needs to be very careful with this data source and it needs additional cura curation before use, as I will show you in later slides. Another one, uh, important one is supernatural. That the problem is though that it's not officially downloadable, although it seems from the literature that some people managed to um, request the data from the server in in innovative ways. The dictionary of natural product has been long the, the reference database. The problem is the high costs in the licensing. So the question, of course, is from an academic point of view, does it give us added value? Then a very useful database um, is or was the UNPD, uh, the Universal Natural Products Database, which is no longer, at least I didn't find it, no longer in the uh, online, it has also it's quite a comprehensive collection of compounds and so on. Um, so these are encyclopedic um, natural product databases, but there are also uh, others that are more focused. For example, there are lots of useful data sets on traditional Chinese uh, medicines or traditional Chinese, me um, sorry, traditional medicines from um, other regions in the world. There are also databases that are focused on, on specific habitats or geographic regions. So for example, um, databases on marine life, quite comprehensive ones on African or also on South American uh, databases, um, um, plants and, and organisms. And um, there are also databases um, that are more focused, for example, on specific organisms, on specific biological activities, or even on specific uh, molecular scaffolds. So one uh, interesting bit of information for you, maybe uh, to know what is basically the added value if I purchase the Dictionary of Natural Products that has been used as a reference work for so long. So we did uh, an overlap with the free natural products libraries that we collected. So we, we are always trying to go basically for the maximum, uh, uh, for, for basically for a comprehensive representation of the current knowledge by not making um, um, any um, significant uh, compromise on data quality. So if you collect uh, these data sets and we overlap them, then we come to the conclusion that about 70% of the data included in the dictionary of natural product can be also found and retrieved from elsewhere. Now, if we want to basically screen uh, these compounds at the end, we should test them in experiment, right? So we should basically, so it's basically the aim to basically identify uh, bioactive compounds and, and test them 
in uh, make sure that they are actually active by, by testing them uh, at least in vitro. So, so if we so what we did is basically we took the readily purchasable compounds that are listed in zinc and overlapped them with our natural product library data set. And we came to the conclusion that only about 10% of the known natural products are readily obtainable. If we increase or if we give this some fussiness and say uh, we are looking at or we are fine with any related structure, so usually natural product derived compounds or so semi-synthetic compounds, then the percentage increases to about 25%, but it's still low. Now these compounds are distributed all over the place and one um, of the interesting learnings that we found is that substantial numbers of natural products are available from providers that have no mentioning that they are providing natural products. Um, so, so there are actually some hidden treasures out there. So because these data sets are often noisy, they are not clean, they are not composed of only uh, genuine natural products, we were very interested in coming up um, with a machine learning approach to identify natural products. So we again used our uh, well curated natural products data set um, and, co um, and um, synthetic compounds from zinc, which we also curated in multiple steps uh, to train a machine learning model. And you see already from this principal component analysis, this is not expected to be a particularly challenging task, at least for large parts of the chemical space. And this is exactly what uh, we also see um, with this machine learning approach, which is a simple random forest model, model based. Uh, so the, the best model was basically, I think, so, so basically the max keys were absolutely, absolutely actually sufficient. You see there's hardly any difference between using either of the fingerprints, the, the 2D descriptors or the FISCAM properties did not work uh, as well, but the, between different fingerprint representation, there was not really a difference. And, and you see that they perform um, extremely well, which is expected to some extent because um, the classification problem is not really a very challenging one. But the, the, um, this model can be very useful because it can allow you to really profile uh, databases to, to design new data sets. And it's very important um, to, to basically um, use these methods uh, when you investigate other databases. So see, for example, in Campbell, there is a substantial fraction of natural products, uh, but the, the bulk of the data is actually compounds that are uh, rather synthetic. Um, they have a synthetic character. Um, interestingly, there's a subset provided by Campbell the, from the Journal of Natural Products, which uh, people um, or scientists often confuse and use as a reference data set for natural products. But looking closely at that, you see there are some uh, compounds in there that are actually uh, likely to be synthetic. And we, we looked up these compounds and these were simply uh, reagents, which are also published, of course, in the Journal of Natural Products, but they are clearly of synthetic origin. So and, and this approaches like this can help you to clean up your data set. And, and um, for example, with, if you have like a fingerprint representation, uh, like we were using the Morgan uh, two fingerprints in this case, then you can also use this to uh, generate such nice similarity maps, which show you the, the regions, so they basically actually the individual atoms that contribute strongest to the classification to um, one or the other direction. So for example, this ring system was detected as being particularly characteristic for the natural product class, while uh, this part here, uh, which looks very, uh, has a very uh, synthetic character uh, is also detected as, as such. And there are not, not only these machine learning approaches out there, there's for example, uh, rule-based approaches or statistical approaches out there in particular from Peter Erdl, they work quite, uh, they, they work just as well as this machine learning approach. Um, there's just um, one of the, of the added feature, maybe um, this uh, visualization here. So, and now not focusing entirely just on natural products, but what we often have uh, also in our research environment is that um, people extracting natural products uh, from, from plants and other organisms, they have these uh, very precious substances in their vials and they have no idea what these compounds could be useful for, right? So, so you have these very precious materials and you try to come up with a target of interest. And um, Giesbert already mentioned one of the tricks or the key trick is actually to look at substructures to see 
how can uh, complex molecules, how can we basically um, cut them into parts and use um, the existing um, biological data, which is very much focused on, on the classic small molecules, drug-like compounds, to derive the targets. And I uh, did uh, some experiment to just uh, get an estimation of how well this can actually work. So uh, for this exercise, we basically um, we, we split the Campbell database into compounds that we call um, complex molecules and non-complex molecules. So the non-complex ones are those that medicinal chemists would you know, identify as the average um, drug-like molecule, and, and the complex ones are those that are fairly clearly beyond, so that have at least 45 heavy atoms or uh, a macrocycle. And then we selected uh, 20, 80, 28 proteins from the Campbell database. They are representative of the pharmaceutical chemical space, and they have large sets of data behind. And we split the individual biological data sets, again, in the, um, the non-complex molecules, for which we know the bioactivities, and the complex molecules, for which we want to know the bioactivities. And uh, we represented the reference set as um, uh, with, uh, with conformers, with uh, conformer ensembles, up to 400 conformers, and then used uh, shape screening with rocks to uh, get ranked ordered lists of, um, of uh, targets. So that basically the rank is based on the closest match within the bioactivity data set of a compound. And our data set uh, covers 3,642 different proteins. And what this slide basically shows you is how early in this list, uh, in this hit list of targets, you can find uh, the correct target. And uh, I would just focus, so we, we investigated four different scoring functions, but the clear, the best one is the Tanimoto Combo score, which, which considers shape and pharmacophoric interactions. So basically a uh, chemistry flavor, which considers hydrogen bonds, aromatic uh, features, and so on. Uh, uh, aromat uh, aromatic flavors and so on. And uh, what, it, uh, what it shows is basically for 20% of these complex molecules, you can, uh, the, the, the correct target is ranked at position number one out of 3,642. And this then steadily increases to about 40% uh, that of the complex molecules that you find within the top 10 targets. And only in four cases out of the 28 targets, we don't have at least one out of our 10 query molecules at position number one. So even though this, this curve looks not particularly fancy, not particularly promising, but you need to think about this um, in a way that you're not uh, taking these predictions blindly. So usually medicinal chemists, scientists have a very strong um, you know, background on their compounds. They have not just one active compound, they hopefully have more compounds. And they can exclude many of the predicted targets simply by looking at the targets and the, pharmac and the underlying pharmacology. So it's actually, if we look into the details, then we can get very far with these methods. Now, the nice thing about this shape-based method is that the performance is not dropping dramatically as the, the, the difference in the size between the compound of interest, so your natural product in this background, and the closest compound in the, in the, in the, basically in the data set, which is a small molecule, as this increases. So this means basically it doesn't matter if we compare a large molecule to a small molecule or two large molecules or two small molecules, our performance does not drop substantially. And what we also see here is that the good performance uh, rates, they come very early, right? So basically this means that if you have a similarity, a Tanimoto similarity, this is a fingerprint-based similarity uh, of just 0 0.3, then we can already get decent predictions. So this means if, a, if you give a medicinal chemist these two molecules or pairs of molecules, it will be a very tough time for them to identify similarity between those compounds. So this is really the nice thing about the shape-based approach or this 
uh, shape is in an approach that considers also pharmacophoric um, interactions that it can really identify remote similarity. So the lessons learned from this is basically that, uh, so if we want to conclude this, then uh, we can identify approximately from one of one third of these complex molecules, we can find uh, the correct, um, the known target among the top five positions of a list of 3,600 uh, 3, uh, proteins. So we can really see that there's a potential to identify uh, this distant similarity. And the nice thing is that you also get uh, one nice aspect of this approach is that you get these interpretable alignments. So, you know, just, just look at them and judge for yourself if you trust this prediction, if you think that this is plausible um, or not. And the nice thing is also that the final prediction relies on a single data point. So if you really then go to the point where you want to purchase that, uh, that molecule or, or, or basically synthesize it or whatever and test it, before that, you can just simply go to the literature and decide for yourself if that single data point that your prediction relies on is, um, is trustworthy. So uh, in my conclusion, it is, uh, these methods are actually um, fairly effective and they're always worth a try. In the last few minutes of my talk, I would like to present you um, our latest work, which is on, on ring systems in natural products. So, Ring systems are really at the center of drug discovery, right? So all, um, so the vast majority of drugs, more than 90% contain at least one ring system. And these ring systems, they determine the shape and the conformational flexibility, as well as the orientation of the substituents. And there have been some uh, very important works, actually many years ago already, and from also Giesbert's group and, and Peter Oertel's uh, research environment, where they looked at these ring systems. But then the focus shifted a bit away from uh, ring systems towards more, uh, towards uh, scaffolds, looking at molecular scaffolds. Now, the limitations of the studies uh, previously is obviously in 2001 and 2008, there were, was much less data on natural products available. And what also, um, actually most studies do not take into account is aspects related to stereochemistry, 3D shape and electrostatic. So our aim was again to build a data set that is as comprehensive as possible without uh, compromising on data quality and to get as accurately as possible numbers for ring systems in natural products, statistics on that. So we started from this uh, coconut data set, but we, we so this coconut um, database, we, we uh, underwent with it uh, substantial um, uh, curation steps. So we, we, we systematically identified data sources that are noisy, that are polluted with synthetic compounds. And we did a lot of effort actually in in, in curating these data sets. And we did the same effort actually with the synthetic compounds to systematically identify data sets that are polluted, polluted with compounds that are uh, directly uh, available in nature. And there was, was a lot of errors that we came across and, and problems that we came across and we, we tried to really solve them to, to a very, very large extent. Um, another a nice aspect of this work is so, the, actually, this, this code is uh, available on GitHub. So the, we have uh, this uh, RD kit based method for ring system extraction. So you get very nice ring systems. And the most important bit is actually uh, how we deal with the stereochemical, stereochemical information. You see this as, as this example here. You may run across um, compounds in your data set. They have many, many different uh, stereochemical representations. Some of them are fully annotated, but disagree. Some others are not annotated or not fully annotated with regard to the stereochemical information. And we used uh, evidence-based logic to basically come up with the most complete data set. So when we, when we consider stereochemical information, we have these three compounds in our data set. We have clear evidence that these, these two compounds are unique. And this one is part, can be basically mapped with this one. So 
if we, if we consider the stereochemistry, our data set will be built as this. If we disregard it, our data set looks like this. We have only this single representation. And this is a very simple case here. This can become very complex. I will show you one example of that. So, so by this, we were able to generate really clean uh, data on what we know when we consider the stereochemistry and what we know of natural product ring systems when we disregard it. And you see here, this is, uh, gives you some indication of, uh, what, of, of the numbers of natural products that we're looking at in the ring system. So we are looking again at about roughly 250, 270,000 natural products. And in those, we have 38,000 um, 38, uh, ring systems. Um, these don't decrease uh, dramatically if we disregard the stereochemical information because many of them are chiral and for many of them at least one stereochemical center is annotated. For the synthetic compounds you see a substantial drop in the numbers because um, for these ones we have much fewer uh, annotations actually available of the stereochemical information. And you see here this enormous difference in the diversity of the natural uh, product ring systems versus the synthetic compounds. So basically one ring system um, represents just seven natural products, but almost 200, depending on whether you disregard or consider stereochemistry, almost 200 synthetic compounds. So the diversity among the natural product ring systems is enormous. And, and there, there's lots of information in this paper and, and I can only show you a very few bits of information. So these are, for example, the most uh, frequent ring systems in natural products if you um, align uh, them and uh, disregard actually uh, the this, this stereochemistry. Then, no, sorry, this is when you consider the stereochemistry. So this ursolic acid here is, uh, uh, comes already at uh, rank number 22. Um, but if you would, uh, if you basically disregard stereochemistry, if you work with this structure, then you need to be, you are able to map 105 different stereoisomers, and this one is then pushed towards uh, rank number uh, seven. So only from this compound here, uh, from, from this natural product ring system, you see we have 105 different um, stereochemical um, isomers, and here we just list the 30 most frequent ones. And now the interesting part is, of course, what of this is relevant for drug discovery and what has been explored in drug discovery. In, in the approved drugs, uh, we found approximately 600 ring systems and 71% are covered by natural products. So that is really quite of a nice uh, number. And the other way around, only 2% of the natural product ring systems are also represented in approved drugs. So this means there's a lot uh, more way to go. And just like the, you know, the, the molecular property of the, of, of the global molecule, the physical chemical property space of natural product ring systems is much more diverse, um, as, as you can see from this uh, PCA um, again. And um, coming to my, uh, almost my last slide, um, one thing that I wanted to point out is that we also compared these ring systems in the 3D molecular space, taking into account um, um, shape and electrostatics. And the nice thing you see here is that, um, so, so what you get from these uh, distributions of similarity in the, in the basically in the, um, in the, in the three-dimensional space or with three-dimensional representations, you come to the conclusion that about 15% of the natural uh, product ring systems are represented by uh, synthetic compounds. So those that are readily purchasable, we are always talking about readily purchasable synthetic compounds. And 50% uh, of them are covered by, uh, by closely related, related ring systems. So closely we consider anything that has uh, this uh, ET combo score um, of 1.6 uh, and higher. So, so to conclude from that, uh, the structures of natural product ring systems are of enormous diversity and they are by no means uh, fully explored in the context of natural products research um, by now. And uh, just uh, on my very last slide, I wanted to show you that many of the tools that are relevant to natural product act discovery are actually available on the, on the web service of our group. So we have, um, we have uh, models that are particularly 
also well applicable to natural products, which include, for example, site of metabolism prediction, because here we're looking at local atom environments. And even though these models are largely trained on synthetic molecules, the atom environments are surprisingly redundant. So you have a huge coverage of the natural product chemical space if you look at only proximate atom environments. Then what I also mentioned is that natural products are often um, interfere with assays and we have a, a machine learning approach available to predict uh, or identify frequent hitters. Then you also find on our website the model for natural product uh, likeness prediction and Scout. Yeah, and with this, I thank you very much for the intention, attention and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Hannes, for this very interesting talk, uh, fascinating story. Uh, I was wondering the tetrazole ring system in a natural product. I've never seen a tetrazole in a natural product so far. Where did you spot that one? No, that's in approved drugs. Look, this is approved drugs. Ah, okay. Yeah, that would be a bit. <laughs> that would be a bit elaborate. Sorry. Yes, okay. that is the approved drugs. <laughs> Excellent, excellent, excellent work. So, a couple of questions. I don't know if you could comment on uh, the relationship between the structural complexity of natural products and specificity versus the high promiscuity of some of these natural products. Um, that um, so. Th so there's definitely this relationship that the more complex the compound, the more selective it is, but. For the complex molecules, we have really few data points in the in the in the in the databases, right? So I can It's very difficult to get uh, proper statistics on that because, for the natural products, the few that are actually included in in PubChem or or, or Campbell, um, you have to not measured on too many different uh, proteins. So that's a very tough but very very interesting question, of course. Thank you. Another quick question. Probably, are you like looking for like how many ring systems from natural products are on on-demand libraries? On on-demand libraries, we didn't we didn't do that yet. No, no, we didn't do that yet. Thank you.